Hello there, fellow witchers. I'm Kato Genesis, and welcome to a beginner's crash course for Gwent, the collectible card game in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This is something I personally skipped the first time through the game, and it's something you definitely can. But there are quests that involve Gwent, and some of the ideal outcomes of these quests involve you winning games of Gwent. There's also the whole another thing to collect thing. Anyway, if you're looking to learn how to play Gwent, here we go. Shortly after you begin The Witcher 3, Aldert Geert in the White Orchard's Tavern initiates the Gwent tutorial when you speak to his table. But the info given through this tutorial can be overwhelming or low priority due to the story's feeling of urgency and how silly it sounds from the outside to hear Geralt in basically one breath say, I gotta find Yennefer. Let's play cards though. Even though the Gwent tutorial can be accessed at any time through the menu's tutorial section, some parts aren't always clear. In turn, this is me trying to explain Gwent in a clear way. And if a particular aspect has you stumped, timestamps are down below. Innkeepers and merchants are usually the ones holding all the cards so to speak. Some non-player characters will sell cards while others will grant you one when you win against them. After finding one of these non-player characters willing to play Gwent, you'll get to set a wager of gold, make any last minute changes to your deck, then begin the match. Players draw 10 cards with the option of redrawing two of them. Then a coin is flipped to determine who goes first. Each player then takes turns placing cards on the field, either until both players are out of cards or one of them passes the round. When a unit card is placed on the field, the card's strength adds to their side's overall score, and whomever has the higher total card score wins the round. A game of Gwent is won if a player beats out their opponent's unit score two out of three rounds. By appearance, Gwent is just a simple numbers game, right? If it was that simple though, the only strategy would need to be to shove all the highest point value cards into your deck. But because your starting hand is only 10 cards, players have to know when to play and when to pass to come back strong the next round. If you happen to lose a match or are not entirely confident in winning, no big deal. Depending on where you set your wager, you're still only losing a little bit of gold and some time, but gaining the knowledge of what your opponent is going to be using against you. And just knowing that can prepare you to outfit your deck to combat it better next time. If you happen to win a match against someone and it's the first time you've won with this person, they'll reward you with a card to add to your collection. The three rows on each side of the field represent the kinds of units you can put down each turn. These three rows are broken down into close combat, represented by sword, range, represented by bow, and siege, represented by the catapult symbol. Despite its appearance, there is no rock, paper, scissors strategy involved with units themselves. Siege cards are no more powerful against close combat, just as ranged cards are to siege. After cards are placed, total points for that row are added up on the left side. On the right side of the field are where the player and their opponent's decks are kept, the amount of cards in those decks are shown, and the discard pile is just to the left of them. There's a lot of, let's call it stuff, on the panel to the left of the field. Think of it as the stat screen for the current game. Most you're likely to be tracking over here though is player scores for the current round of course, and how many rounds each player has left to lose, noted by the life gems. Weather cards, even though they're visible on the field too, will be shown here as well. A final note on the field is when you are playing Gwent, there is no time limit when it's your turn. And you can use this time to also inspect the cards that are visible to you. This is a strategy game after all, so knowing what your opponent uses against you can better prepare you for the future. Each Gwent deck used has a faction, determining the units available for that deck outside of neutral ones, the leader card available, and the faction's abilities. The deck that you start with is of the Northern Realms faction. The Northern Realms ability allows you to draw a card if you've won the previous round. Full Test King of Temeria, the starting leader for Northern Realms, lets you play a Fog Weather card out of your deck instantly once per game. The main thing to keep in mind here is that each faction, combined with its leader, kind of has its own gimmick. The first deck nudges you to use siege and close combat units, so lean into it. But keep an eye on what your opponent is using as a leader and faction too. Gwent cards are separated into a few categories. Most of what you'll be using though are unit cards. Here's a quick explainer on what you see when you look at a unit card. The number on the upper left hand corner is the card's point or strength value. Just below that is the row that the card fits into. And just below that is the unit's ability if it has one. The art and flavor text are there to be appreciated. Some unit cards are in the category known as hero cards. And these hero cards are usually representations of main characters in the Witcher story. 
both in the Wild Hunt and previous games. Hero unit cards are identified by the gold sunburst around their unit strength, which is usually a high number. Despite heroes being powerful, keep in mind that they are completely immune to other cards abilities, your opponents and your own, so you can still lose with a deck full of heroes. Some unit cards have abilities that activate either once they hit the field or are affected by other conditions, represented by a white icon. These abilities, like special cards, can completely change the outcome of a round if played at the right moment. Inspecting a card either in the deck builder or during a match will tell you what its ability can do. Tight Bond is among the first abilities you'll come across, represented by two shaking hands. Tight Bond simply doubles the strength of cards with the same name as more enter the field. Throw down two or three units with Type Bond, then top it off with a Commander's Horn to maximize that row's strength. Medic, represented by a cross inside of a heart, can resurrect a unit from your discard pile, putting them on the field immediately. Spy, represented with a sneaky looking eye, places this unit on your opponent's side of the field, adding to their strength value, but in turn, you get to draw two cards. The last example of abilities I'll give is Muster, which is symbolized by two helmets, one in front of the other. You'll come across Muster probably the most facing off against Scoia'tael and Monster decks. Muster finds all cards with the same name from the player's hand and deck and places them onto the field as well. It's generally close combat cards that have Muster though, so the Biting Frost Weather card will come in handy in this case. These are just some examples of unit abilities, and each of them have ways to be used or countered effectively. Special cards are what can help turn the tide of a match in a big way, and what keeps Gwent from being just a numbers game. Weather cards and other special cards can affect specific targets, specific rows, or the entirety of the field. The special card called Commander's Horn, for example, doubles the strength of one row of cards on your side of the field. The impenetrable fog weather effect, on the other hand, reduces the strength of all ranged cards on the field to one, yours and your opponent's. If an opponent plays a weather card to reduce your own unit's strength, you can remove it with Clear Weather, a entire weather removal card. While on the subject of fair weather, make sure you're adding weather that helps rather than hinders the majority of your units. Like, don't bring Torrential Rain if you're mostly using Siege units. One other special card I'd like to mention though is the Decoy card in particular, which has a ton of versatility. Decoy returns a card on your side of the field to your hand. Say your opponent is coming on really strong in the first round, pumping their units to 40 strength or more in only a few turns. You can use Decoy to put your strongest card back into your hand, lose this round, and come back strong in the second. Decoys can also be used on spies your opponent has played. These are just a few of the special cards available. What I recommend is four to six of these special cards in the deck you happen to play with to experiment with strategies or just have those weather effects just in case. Outside of a match, your Gwent decks are accessible through the menu, just under the tutorial section. From the deck builder, you can create and modify your Gwent decks for each of the factions to your liking, switch out the leader card, read up on what the other faction abilities are, and more. Gwent decks have a maximum of 35 cards, but 22 of them must be units. Being the starting hand is 10 cards in a match though, maximizing the deck size only seems to help the monster decks the most due to their affinity for the muster ability. If you're not using a monster deck, I'd say shoot for about 26 to 28 cards. That's 22 being units, 4 to 6 being special and weather cards. The full card pool is available for each deck too, and is only limited by faction. So you can place a neutral unit you've been using in your Northern Realms deck into your Nilfgaardian Empire deck at the same time. The deck builder menu will also come up just before you start a match, so final adjustments can be made beforehand too. This is particularly useful if you're going for a rematch because, like I said towards the beginning, if you lose the first game against this opponent, you can then better prepare because you now know the faction that they're using, have a notion of the units they're going to be dropping on the field, and what you can do to counter those things. The Witcher 3 is massive, so finding everyone who has Gwent cards to sell to you or play for is a challenge to be sure. However, when it comes to rare and hero cards, quests will become available to acquire them over time. A good rule of thumb for this is to keep track of the main players in the story. Many of them will have cards that you can win. If you're following the main storyline, the Bloody Baron will be among the first to offer you a rare card once you beat him in Gwent and also start you on your way to finding the rest of the rare cards. 
hopefully you've gotten at least a little of what you've been looking for in this guide, from how to play Gwent, to how to get more cards, and an overview of Gwent's systems. If you do have anything you're still confused on, or any further questions, I'm sure there'll be people in the comments who are willing to help out, myself included. Those of you knowledgeable in Gwent too, please share your wisdom. I like to do my best to encourage the community helping each other as well. Thank you to Wasteland Legend Sven and the other supporters on screen for supporting the channel. If you feel like joining the people in the credits and helping the channel at the same time, give the Patreon a look. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and I hope you take care of yourself.